On the screen, I have three words. He is worthy. Do you agree? I'm glad you agree. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 18. We want to talk about some of the reasoning why he's worthy. Psalm chapter 18. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. Now this, this particular psalm actually gives us some context as to why the psalm was written in the first place. Um, a lot of scripture doesn't necessarily give us that short summary uh, ahead of the scripture, but this one does. And it's, it's one of the longest ones in the Bible. I think it's the second longest uh, kind of introduction, at least in the psalms. Um, the actual, actually, verse 1 is not that long, but the introduction takes up a lot of space there. But uh, let's, let's read that. Uh, if you would, let's all stand together and read God's Word. It says, To the choir master, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who addressed the words of this song to the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul he said I love you O Lord my strength the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my God my rock in whom I take refuge my shield and the horn of my salvation my stronghold I call upon the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies you may be seated Heavenly Father, thank you today for giving us another opportunity to come to your house and worship today. Father, I pray that uh, as we go through the message today, Lord, that you speak ahead of me, Lord, and that uh, I, don't, I don't get ahead of you. And Father, I just pray that ears and hearts would be open through this message. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, he gives this long introduction to this psalm and gives us some context of, of why He's writing what he's writing. Now, you know, uh, I think most of you are familiar with David's story that um, God had anointed him to, to be the next king. The, he had anointed him to be king, and, you know, the people wanted a king. And so the people, the people chose a king by their standards and not by God's standards. And so they, they picked someone that fit the part. But David uh, was somebody that God said, or oh, you know what, you fit the part. But this guy Saul, who became king, he sought David out and he tried to kill him on multiple occasions. And God spared Saul because David had plenty of chances during his time. And, and he even told Saul that he had chances. You know, there was a few times that Saul, he felt bad about it, that uh, David had spared his life. And then, you know, he got to thinking and, and dwelling again. And so he decided to go and go after David again. And eventually, uh, eventually King Saul was someone who took his own life uh, and after an ugly battle with the Philistines, and it didn't end well for him. And then also uh, one of David's sons, Absalom, he decided that he wanted to overtake the throne, overtake David. And so David had, had to flee from him and struggle with him, and you know he ended up getting killed. And so David had been pursued. David had been pursued by his enemies. And during that time... David fully relied on God for protection. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you are pursued by the enemy? If you're not being pursued by the enemy, then that, that means you're part of the enemy. Now that might strike you. 
You've heard that old saying that if the devil don't bother you, that means he's already got you. So if the enemy is not bothering you, then maybe you're the enemy. You think about that for a minute. You ponder on that. But if you're a Christian, and you love Jesus, then the enemy's going to be after you. Because the enemy wants to rob, steal, and destroy any happiness and joy that you have. In whatever form they can get it from you. But it's, it's ultimately to destroy you of what God made you to be. God made us to worship Him. To call out to Him. And to praise Him. And here, after David had gone through these these trials in his life of, of constantly being pursued by the enemy because, you know, God had anointed something. God had did something here that was not going to be displaced. And I can assure you that God has anointed each of us for something in our lives and, and it's not going to be the evil. The enemy is not going to uh, move God out of the way. That's just not going to happen. But don't think for a second that the enemy is not going to try. And, they, and the enemy will do its level best to deter the plans that God has for you. And so here, we can take some notes out of what David does. David here, after going through these trials, now, we may not physically have somebody running after us, running through the hills, you know, trying to run a sword through us. Or shoot an arrow through our heart. We may not have that. But we do have enemies. The devil and his minions are seeking to destroy our lives if they can. And they have tried. They will continue to try. But as David recognized that, we can recognize that too. There's something that we can do. Number one, David, he counted on God. How many of you can say that today? I count on God. When I'm in trouble, I count on God. How many of you can go to this psalm and say in verse 1, I love you, O Lord, my strength. Who is your strength today? Is it you? Man, we try, don't we? We've talked about this a lot. We try. We try to make it our strength. But he says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. We need to acknowledge God. We need to acknowledge Him for who He is and the strength that He has when we don't. Because so often we don't have strength. Any strength that we might muster, it comes from Him, right? Can I get an amen? amen? But in verse 2, He says some things here. He makes some analogies. And so I want you to understand this. He said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Now, something you got to understand about the, the wilderness area, it's very barren. And if you've ever seen any pictures of the wilderness of Israel, the Judean wilderness, it's, it's not very hospitable. There's not a lot of greenery. There's not a lot of trees. There are some rocks, though. And one of the things, there was a pastor, uh, uh, not a pastor, he was a, well, I guess he was a pastor also, but he was a, he was a scholar, and, and he decided to embark on this journey of studying the word rock. Now, that, that doesn't seem like something that's real fun, does it? And I guess unless you're a geologist, and you just want to do that thing. But he wasn't doing it for that purpose. He wanted to understand, what was the spiritual significance of studying the word rock? And so here's a couple things that he come up with. And he said, you know, in the scriptures when we think about it, and you know, historically, if you go to Israel and you see it, and you understand kind of the landscape, and understand where David was at. You know, his only refuge might have been a rock. Because think about this, you're out there in the hot sun. There's not any trees. But there's some rocks that protrude. And if you're out there in that dry wilderness, something that'll happen is on the dark side of that rock. It can become a small oasis, 
of where someone might be able to find a small pool of water on the other side of that rock. And they might find some relief from the hot sun. They find refuge. Now think about it. How many of you have ever been out in the hot sun? I know, I know Doug back there, he knows all too well. He works outside all the time. Some of you other folks do as well. But it's nice when you find some shade, ain't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, back then, finding the dark side of a rock, that was David's air condition, or anybody's air condition. And so, you know, part of that was being uh, a structure where you could find security and safety and refuge and maybe quench your thirst. So there was a lot of things that the word rock means here. You think about it in those terms now. What, what is Jesus to you? On those, those times where you may be in your wilderness and you're being pursued by the enemy and you need refuge, you need shade, you need protection. Is Jesus that for you? Does He provide that? Does He quench your thirst? When we go to Him... And we let Him be those things. He is those things. But it says he's, it's also that He's my fortress and my deliverer. And, and if you remember as David was walking through the wilderness, now also within the wilderness, you got some, some hilly regions. Uh, along with these rocks, you might have some caves. And remember, we know one instance where David was in a cave and, and Saul had went into this cave to relieve himself. And, and David cut a little piece of his robe off while he was in there. Just letting him know, I could have got you if I wanted to. So there was a lot of caves. So David had found, you know, David knew these areas. And so David, uh, David found protection within these caves. Is that what Jesus, is Jesus, is, is he our protection? Do we seek him out as a safe place from the enemy? Like David sought out a cave. Because all of a sudden in that cave, that became his fortress. What is God to you? Is he your fortress? My deliverer. Has anybody ever been rescued? Okay, well, one person has. What if you, has any of you ever been in a precarious situation and somebody helped you out and you felt like you were rescued? I think most of us have been in some situation where maybe our heart started beating a, a skip faster. A little, bit, a little bit faster and we were anxious and somebody came along and helped us out and delivered us. The enemy is, is seeking you. He's wanting you. He's wanting to tear you down. He's wanting to destroy you if he can. And isn't it great to know that we have someone who can deliver us from that? And we can feel the relief that when we are rescued from the enemy. The enemy is not going to leave us alone. The closer you get to God, the more he's probably going to bother you. So isn't it nice that you can just count on God to rescue you from the evil one? You know, he even modeled that in the, in, in the prayer that we all know so well. The Lord's Prayer. Deliver us from the evil one. Did you know that? Did, did you pick up on that? Deliver us from evil. But the actual Greek there means evil one. So in that prayer, Jesus is taking it and saying, you know, it's not just evil I'm delivering from. It is from the evil one. We trust in God to deliver us from the evil one. We need to be rescued, people. Do you not understand why we have the cross? It was to deliver us. We need to be delivered. We need to be rescued. 
he continues, My God, my rock. He reinforces the notion that you are my God, you are my rock, you're my everything, in, in whom I take refuge. How many of you are saying today, Lord, I take refuge in you? You're my rock, my fortress. How many of you are saying that today? Now the other thing that's interesting about this scholar who decided to study a rock, what it meant, the spiritual side of this, what it meant. There was also a military side to this. Because you can take refuge behind rocks. You can get advantage from the rock. Now, where does this come into play? Who knew the scriptures? I think David knew them pretty well. How well do you know the scriptures? Remember, we did a little, little four-question test last week. I know some of you missed it. If you'd like to take it, I can get you one. David knew the scriptures. So he was able to use that as an advantage against the enemy. He knew that God had anointed him. When you read the scriptures, you know that God has something special for you. It's called love. He loves you that much. Remember he did that, you know, that thing where he came down from glory. He stepped down off his throne and said, you know what? I'm going to be like one of these mangy, evil humans and... I'm going to be born and live in this old dark world and go through all them things they go through. And then I'm going to go on that cross and die for which I don't deserve to die. But I'm going to do it anyway because I love them so much. He did that. So when we understand what God did and why he did it. It gives us an advantage over the enemy. It, it, it lets us, it kind of gives us an inside, uh, kind of, you know, people say a little bit of inside baseball. They start to understand the enemy's tactics and its plans. And you can see it. And you can learn from it. And that's what David had done. David had learned all those things. And so it became a military tactic. The Lord is the best teacher to give us tactics against the evil one. We can't fight against the evil one. Go back and read Jude and you'll learn that. Even the strongest angel, Michael, he said he, he can't do it on his own. He has to call on the name of the Lord when he battles Satan. So he goes into battle for us. But we can be good little soldiers behind him. And when we do that, here's what he says. He says, he's my shield. If somebody's shooting arrows at you. Wouldn't it be nice to have a little something to protect you? Have that shield. You know, Paul talks about that, talking about, you know, the whole armor of God. He talks about having a shield. He says, in the horn of my salvation. Horn there, that word means, in, in pretty much every instance that it's talked about, it means, talks about power. Horn means power. Who is the power of your salvation? I can tell you who it ain't. It ain't you. You have no power for salvation. I have no power for salvation. He's the only one that can provide power for salvation because he's the one that gave it to you. So David recognizes all of these things. He's my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. And I take ref refuge in him. He is my shield. He is the power of my salvation. And he is my stronghold. He is the place where we can go where we can go nowhere else. He is the place. How many of you think about that from the time you get up to the time you go to bed? When you're faced with a problem, how many of you think about that? 
each and every day we're faced with obstacles. We're faced with things. And he's telling us, hey, look, it don't have to be that bad. You can trust in me. I can provide for you. That's what he's saying to each one of us. He's saying, I can provide for you. How many of you believe that today, that the Lord will provide for you? He will. He will provide. Now, after David had said these things, and, and if you read all of chapter 18, chapter 18 is talking about his deliverance from his, from his enemies. So you can read the whole chapter. But verses 1 through 3 kind of provide a summary for the rest of the psalm. But I want to call your attention to verse 3 specifically. Now after he had mentioned all these things and he lays out all of these descriptions, these analogies. About who God is and, and what he is to us. Sometimes he's these things when we don't even want him to be. And how do I know that? Is because I know that God was with me even when I didn't want him to be with me. Because I would not be standing here today if he had not. Because I tried. I really did. I tried to get away from him. Kind of like Jonah. I tried to run. He wouldn't let me. But if it wasn't for him, I know I wouldn't be here. And I know the same for you all as well. But after saying all of these things, outlining all of these different things that God is. He said, I call upon the Lord. Now pay attention. I don't want you to miss it. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be what? Praised. He is worthy to be praised. Now I know some of you are thinking, oh preacher, here you go again beating on that drum, beating that dead horse again. Well, I'll tell you, it ain't a dead horse. And I'm going to beat it for as long as I'm here. He is worthy of praise. Every second of every day for all eternity, He is worthy of praise. And what do you think of a church that cannot praise Him? Tell me right now. Tell me. What is it? What can you say about a church? Go to Y'all go to any other church, anywhere, and you walk in. And there's not one muster of praise given out for him. What are you going to think? What are you going to think about that church? There you go. Spiritually dead. It's because people really don't think he's worthy of it. Because if you really thought he was worthy, and I'm saying this with all honesty... If you really thought he was worthy, then you could muster a praise. And here's why I tell you this. If you say that he is all these things, then you'll praise him. How many praises were offered up this morning? I heard five minutes of dead silence. You know, it's funny. Terry brought up something in, in Bible study one day. He said, you know, a lot of churches don't offer an opportunity to praise God. In the friend's tradition, we actually give you an opportunity. We actually prompt you to do it. And you know, when I think about praise... And I think about a church that can't praise Him, I, I can't help it, but I, every time I go back to Matthew, 
Where Jesus says, if you are ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before the Father. And you know, I can't thank you, no help, but you know, walk out of this church and what if Jesus is standing back there? What if we were to walk out that door and there stands Jesus and he says, you know what, I'm ashamed of you. How do you think that'd make you feel? You know, every single day we go through life. Life is tough, life is hard. But you know who gets us through that life? This life? It is Him. Is He, is he not worthy to at least offer just a little bit of praise? He is worthy to be praised. You know, as I, just as a personal challenge to you, I, I would like you to start writing down. Just write down, jot down on a note somewhere and just start writing down. Why is He worthy? I would imagine you'd run out of paper pretty quick if you really started thinking about why He's worthy to be praised. Let me, let me offer a few things here just to get you started. How many of you woke up with a roof over your head? Let's praise Jesus. How about this? Every time I give you an example, you say, thank you, Jesus. How many of you woke up with a roof over your head? How many of you woke up with more than one pair of clothes this morning? How many of you were able to get in the car and drive here? How many of you still have a spouse that's still living? How many of you have children? How many of you have a church that you can come to and worship with brothers and sisters? Is that, is that enough? Is that enough fire starter there? When you start writing down why he's worthy of your praise? There was a lie somewhere that's been told that we shouldn't praise him. I don't know where it started. We shouldn't praise him vocally. I don't understand it. I just want to, I, just saying thank you, Jesus. I can feel energy bubbling up in me right now, just saying thank you, Jesus. He deserves to be praised because He is worthy of it. And we, we will never run out of ways or run out of ideas of why we need to praise Him. Now, it's just me. It just might be my opinion. I don't know. You can take it for what it's worth. But I know that a church that is willing to praise God is a healthy church. But one that can't even muster a single praise, I know that is headed down the path of being spiritually dead. Now, the Bible promises, Jesus promised that the gates of hell would never, I should take that back, the gates of Hades. That's a whole other thing there. That the gates of Hades would not prevail. And he wasn't lying. But don't you think for a second this church can't close down, because it can. If, the, if this place is spiritually dead, guess what? God will just run us right on out of here. And this, this place can be filled by somebody who might want to. As 
as a Christian, if you purposely and intentionally serve God, you cannot help yourself but to praise Him. You can't help it. I think it's time, high time, we intentionally start praising Him. Because by golly, He is worth it. He is worthy of every bit of it. And we don't do it near enough. Right here, right here is great practice. Skip on over to Revelation because we if you make it there, and I hope all of you are, but for those of you that make it, guess what? You're going to be doing an awful lot of praising for all eternity. Guess what? It ain't going to be quiet either. It's going to be vocal prayers, vocal praise, eternity. Think about it, forever. We, we at least ought to be comfortable doing it here. We can muster praise. And, and I want to say this morning, I, I want to praise God that He has saved me. That He's led me here to where I am standing today because it was all Him. I had nothing to do with this. I'm thankful that He's put me where I am. I'm thankful he's put me in my place where, you know, when I say that, I'm thankful that he's got on to me. I praise him for the discipline that he's given me. And I praise him for this right here, who has helped me with so many of my problems. And I still got a bunch. But I'm thankful for this, that every time I pick this up, I know that I can trust this. I know that I can seek shelter in this. And I know that there's nothing that I can't figure out by looking at this, reading this, and letting Him speak to me. I praise Him today for this. I praise Him for the Holy Spirit who convicts me when I do something wrong. I still do that a lot too. Just ask my wife. <laughs> I praise God for her. I praise God for my friends here. I praise God for this church. praise God for the cross for the empty tomb and I praise him that he's coming back Amen. as we close today I just want to take a few moments and I just want you to I want you to honestly just open your heart to the spirit let the Spirit convict you. Allow the Holy Spirit to truly lead you this morning. If you're truly open to the Spirit, He will prompt you and He will lead you. Some of you might get sweaty palms. It's all right might feel a flutter in your chest. It's okay. You might even hear something in your head. It's the Holy Spirit talking to you, saying, I am worthy. I am worthy of your praise. So just for a few moments this morning, if you have something, truly listen to the Holy Spirit. Truly listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Allow Him to lead you this morning.
I'll stand. I just want to remind you this morning that a church who is able to praise is a church that recognizes God's majesty, that recognizes His glory that recognizes His power and that recognizes that He stepped off His throne into humanity to die on a wooden cross for each and every one of us. A church that praises, we recognize that. He is worthy. Let's all praise Jesus now in a word of prayer. Father God, we, we thank you so much today. We thank you for the opportunity to, to be able to share in your word and, and be, able to, be able to look at your word and, and understand why things were written the way that they were and, and just be able to see it from that perspective and, and put ourselves in, in, in that place. And, and to make it more vivid in our minds of, of, of why we can praise and, and why we should. Lord, we're, we're so thankful 
Lord, we, we grew up in America. We grew up in the greatest country that has ever existed outside of Eden. Lord, we thank you that we have such abundant freedom and that there was that you had provided so much forethought to our forefathers and the insight that they had. And Father, we know that you led them. Lord, and, and we know that you led us all here today. Lord, let us recognize these things. Let us recognize how good you are. Because you are that good. You are that powerful. And you are all of that love. Lord, let us praise you unendingly, Lord. There's so many things we can praise you for. And let us, let us always be mindful of what we can praise you for. Because that is a long list that we'll never be done with. Thank you for each person here. Bless every single person here. Lord, convict their hearts, open their hearts, open their minds, Lord, to what it is that your spirit is trying to say. Lord, let us heed that call so that we can never, so that we will never be ashamed to praise you amongst our brothers and sisters and especially amongst the world. Let us carry that, that call into every time we come together to worship and in every time we're out in the world. Let us remember that, that you are worthy to be praised. Thank you for our time together. Lead us here to the next appointed hour, Lord, and we praise you in all that we do and say. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.